Hello, hello everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is Spencer Rukti. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm the author events manager at Third Place Books here in Seattle, Washington. And on behalf of the store, I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's uh, publication day celebration for Lisa Wells, who is here to talk about her new book, Believers, Making a Life at the End of the World in conversation with Charles D'Ambrosio. Uh, through virtual events like tonight's Third Place Books is really fortunate to continue connecting authors with uh, readers in an intimate setting. Um, we certainly miss having authors in our store, of course, but at the same time, we're very thankful to have this new platform that brings our growing event series into your homes all across the world. So thank you so much for tuning in and for supporting independent bookstores. Before we begin, uh, I wanted to plug a few events from our forthcoming events calendar. On August 2nd, we have Katie Kitamura for her new novel, Intimacies, which has been receiving uh, rave, rave reviews and praise from all around and is a favorite of several of our booksellers. Uh, Matthew Spector on August 4th uh, for his new collection, Always Crashing in the Same Car. Uh, Mona Awad in conversation with Heather O'Neill on August 5th, uh, where they'll be discussing Mona's Shakespearean novel, All's Well. And we have so much more in store for you. You can find our full events calendar on our website at thirdplacebooks.com, um, where I also highly encourage you to sign up for our email newsletter. In a couple of minutes in the Zoom chat below, I will be sharing a link to purchase tonight's featured book, Believers, which is a wonderfully cohesive work about trailblazers and outliers from across the globe who have found radically uh, new ways to live and reconnect to the earth in the face of climate change. If you're in the Seattle area, you can order Believers online and pick up in the store, or you can swing by any one of our locations at Lake Forest Park, Ravenna, or Seward Park um, to get your copy. We're happily open to the public at all three of our stores, and we ship all across the country. Overall, thank you so much for sticking with us during this virtual era. It is strictly because of you that this event series is even possible right now. During tonight's event, uh, I'd also like to remind you that the chat window at the bottom of your screen is open and we encourage you to use it respectfully. Uh, tonight, we also have some time at the end of the event for your questions. So if you have questions for either of our authors, um, you, you can submit your questions in the Q&A window below, which is separate from the chat window at the bottom of your screen. We also offer closed captioning for those who are interested. Just hit the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and you can turn this feature on or off. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, some technical issues may arise, but if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them. Um, so thank you for your patience and your understanding. And now let's introduce tonight's speakers. We are so excited to have the poet and essayist Lisa Wells with us tonight. Lisa's debut collection of poetry, The Fix, was the winner of the Iowa Poetry Prize, and her work has been published by the New York Times, Harper's, Granta, The Believer, and others. She lives in Seattle and is an editor for the Volta and Litter Machine editions. Um, I just want to add in this virtual era, it's uh, surprisingly rare to meet an author in person, um, even as someone who runs an event series. Uh, and I was very fortunate to be able to meet Lisa for about five minutes yesterday when she came in to sign copies of her book. Uh, and it was a rare treat, uh, but keep in mind that you, the books you purchased tonight are bona fide signed copies, uh, not tippins or book plates. Um, joining Lisa in conversation tonight is Charles D'Ambrosio, the author of The Point and Other Stories, The Dead Fish Museum, and two collections of essays, Orphans and Loitering, um, the latter of which um, Kate came from Portland's own Tin House Books in 2014 and has inspired many booksellers such as myself. Many of his stories uh, originally appeared in The New Yorker and he also has published fiction in the Paris Review, Zoetrope All Story, and A Public Space. His work has been widely anthologized and selected for the Pushcart, Pushcart Prize, uh, Best American Short Stories, the O. Henry Award, and he is calling us today from Iowa City, Iowa, where he teaches at the Iowa Writers Workshop. We are all here tonight to celebrate the release of Lisa's book, The Believers, which is out today from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Um, the novelist Lydia Millay uh, reviewed this book for the Los Angeles Times, and she has a remarkable passage that I can't help but read right here. Uh, she writes, quote, in Wells' writing, uh, no argument needs to be made on the data. It's a given that we live in an era of vanishment and homogenization, of tragic loss on an unprecedented scale. The question is not what we face, but how we face it bravely and creatively, how we can curb the destructions we've wrought 
and how as individuals and societies, we can struggle against their desolations and forestall their seeming inevitability. Without further ado, we're so pleased that you are all here today. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy evening to be with us. Let's please welcome Lisa Wells and Charles D'Ambrosio. The virtual stage is both of yours. There we Thanks, are. Spencer. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right. Let's see. This is a book to me that uh, uh, wants conversation, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to be part of it. Uh, it would be it almost seems like it would be a shame to uh, uh, kind of have someone read the, uh, you know, pick up the book, read it, shelve it, and not continue the conversation somewhere else. It seems like it's uh, uh, you know kind of bound to be that way. Uh, it's also a book that uh, um, uh, kind of really kind of grabbed me. Uh, to the point where like I woke up this morning and I felt like I had uh, uh, Lisa Wells goggles on and I read the New York Times, who uh, the great gray lady who rather, uh, you know, um, uh, kind of breathlessly uh, started with this headline, how bad is the bootleg fire? It's generating its own weather, unpredictable winds, fire clouds that spawn lightning and flames that leap over fire breaks and are confounding efforts to fight the blaze, which is sweeping through Southern Oregon. <laughs> and then I immediately thought, picked up my new Bible uh, called Believers, and it's, where, where was, where was, sorry, I got these marked. I actually tried to mark these, but I'll still fumble anyway. Oh, and, and I, I was thinking of this passage. By the time you read this, the Thomas fire will have already receded from public consciousness, though not likely from the minds of those affected. How could it be otherwise? The next round of largest, coldest, hottest, costliest, and deadliest uh, was already queued. Uh, you know, and here we are, you know, many fires down the road, uh, um, still kind of breathlessly uh, uh, reckoning, using the same vocabulary, describing the same fire as if it were all one. Um, I thought what I would do is, uh, uh, um, we want to talk about the issues uh, that you talk about, about uh, climate change and action versus inaction, community, isolation, all of those kinds of things. Uh, uh, but I also want to talk about the work as work, uh, as, as a piece of writing. You know, um, uh, a worthy topic is not, you know, necessarily make a worthy, a worthy book in, in the way I look at things. Uh, you know, there's so much art and so much kind of music in the senses, and it's just the architecture that you build. Uh, and then I want to um, uh, um, uh, talk about the, uh, not lose sight of the central questions. And, and, and one question seems central. I'll just read a couple of passages and then we'll just dive in. Um, the, uh, that point of no return is not the pri You're talking about the point of no return in, in, in the uh, introduction. That point of no return is not the primary subject of this book, but it's, it is the backdrop, the central prophecy. And I just love that sense. It's bold. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then you're quoting from, uh, uh, quoting from the New Testament, and Peter, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Knowing all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? Um, and, and then finally, another question uh, along that just kind of drives that one home. Uh, this is... Um, when you're you're talking with Todd up at the uh, Tau, Tau, Tau initiative tilt tilt yeah yeah That's initiative for life together for life together uh, and uh, he says I hope he says of the initiative of, of the play this meeting is being recorded so thank you for that. Um, he says that's the central question of my life and I you know. I wouldn't have phrased it as such, but it was the central question of mine. Um, as soon as I'd had this initial sort of life-altering revelation as a teenager, which is one of the threads of the book. Yeah. Um, and what that consisted of essentially was reading a few books that, that really um, shifted my whole understanding of the world that I was living in. And to be totally reductive, you know, probably the inherited mythology is that we're on this continuum of evolution where um, 
you know, we started out primitive and then, um, you know, developed all these technologies. And next thing you know, we're gonna, all going to be piloting ships to the stars like Jeff Bezos did today. Um, and that this was an improvement, you know, perhaps ugly along the way at times, but ultimately, you know, and the, the books that I read that so radicalized me, which, you know, um, I won't really speak to their art, but um, the content was very radicalizing. Yeah. One was Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, and the other one were these series of books by this guy, Tom Brown Jr. But the Daniel Quinn story um, reframes this as like, they're essentially the truth, which is that there were myriad ways of living on planet earth and that, you know, a couple of one or two civilizations sort of developed this inherently unsustainable way of making a living that's based in what he calls totalitarian agriculture. And long story short, they're bringing us to the brink of destruction, but this was not inevitable. It's not progress, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So once you know that and you're 15 years old, what do you do about it? <laughs> and my response was to drop out of high school with my friend Peter and my, a couple of other friends and, and go to this wilderness survival training program. So that was the first answer to how to live. And, you know, I think the orientation back then was depressingly familiar to most of us, which was, um, the idea of creating kind of a doomstead, being really badass and all these survival skills like, you know, hunting and gathering and building shelters and, um, and also learning how to be invisible so that you can hide and or hunt your enemies. Um, so it was really wrapped up in that, that kind of macho BS, <laughs> uh, you know, but it was a step. Um, and then when that sort of became unsustainable, this new, kind of literature entered my my world, which was this idea that, you know, civilization should be violently dismantled before it kills everything. Like if you want to have rivers and bears and bees in the world, then you have to get rid of this destructive structure. Um, and then that, you know, that was not really a, a worldview to live into. That was not a, a story about how to live. That was a story about how not to live maybe, um, or how to take something down. But um, it kind of, you know, this is when I turned toward writing and just let it go. <laughs> because it felt, for me at least at 20 or whatever, it just seemed like there was no viable solution. Tearing it down, walking away, these are not viable solutions. Um, it's not a way to live. And so the book, you know, in a way, when you're writing nonfiction, you know, you, you, you write the introduction last and you overlay a story about this intention and journey in order to tie the pieces together. And in some ways it's true and in some ways it's artifice. Um, but that was the question that drove the book. How then shall we live? So what is a positive construct, mythos, way of living that is tenable, you know? Yeah. Yeah, this seems reasonable. I mean, you write the introduction, but you you also made all these discoveries. It seems like quite a journey. I don't know how long it's been since you started the, uh, 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 you know, when the, you know, I don't know the first thing that maybe was going to be part of a book and 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 today, uh, but it's been quite a journey, right? 2014. Yeah. 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 So you know. Uh, it, and it shows the book has a lot of, uh, you know, kind of the kind of layering that can only be partly reflective of the experience of time uh, that you're undergoing, like time is happening to you and you're changing and your perspective is changing. And, and uh, uh, you know, uh, the book makes a, a, a tremendous record of that, uh, of, of that engagement and the change that came with it, I think, uh, you know, um, maybe one of the ways to talk about, uh, you know, the different, uh, um, uh, I, uh, kind of issues that the, the, the book kind of wrestles with would be to um, talk about the individuals here. Um, uh, there are a lot of characters. Uh, um, the book is about people. It's full of people. Uh, and every one of them is trying to make some kind of difference. Uh, um, you know, um, uh, one of the things you do say in the introduction, I'm just going to go back to it, you know, uh, careful of your introductions, I guess, in the future, because Charlie likes them too much. Um, uh, the, uh, well, you say the threats we, are, we, we face are overwhelming, way beyond the scope of our power as individuals, or even as individual nations. And yet as individuals, we must bear the grief of, of, of all that we know. This knowledge exacts a toll. 
A 2017 report by the American Psychological Association noted that changes in climate can surface a number of different emotions, including fear, anger, feelings of powerlessness or exhaustion. Some people are deeply affected by feelings of loss, helplessness, and frustration. It sounds like a description of Hamlet almost. Uh, uh, and I, I remember reading in a, a book called Tragedy is Not Enough, uh, Carl Jasper's formulation said, said tragedy is when awareness uh, kind of exceeds power. Uh, you know, we're, and it seems like that's what, what is being described there. And, and obviously we have a kind of a potent uh, uh, awareness and a kind of feelings of uh, helplessness in the face of action, impotence, you know. Um, yeah. But these people are doing stuff. So, and I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to probably hash some of these names, but I thought, you know, rather than talk about individual sections, I'll just bring up these people. Yeah. Uh, Phoenicia Medrano. Yeah. Phoenicia. Yeah. 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 Okay. So Phoenicia, um, who since passed away, she was the, she was the precipitating figure. Um, so she was a person who I'd been hearing about for a long time. And the way I originally remember hearing about her was my friend Peter and my friend Willem ha would both talk about this grandma who was traveling itinerantly around the American West, um, replanting these uh, wild edible roots, which I didn't really understand what that meant, but it sounded cool. And it kind of was in the back of my mind for a long time. and. Um, you know, I was leaving a marriage and kind of out on my own for the first time and at loose ends. And I had one of these postgraduate teaching gigs. So I had some time and um, freedom. And I and Peter let me come out to her camp, um, their winter camp. They were so they were stopped in one place um, on the Oregon Idaho border through the winter. And they were preparing to pack up their camp. And a as we were leaving, they were, and they were about to head out for 40 days, which wound up being 80 something days that they were out planting these gardens. So, or replanting these gardens. Um, and Phoenicia just had an incredible life. So later she had self-published this book and that was really what um, blew my mind because all of the people in the book, what they have in common, and I think I, I told, our friend Alex this, it's like they're, they come with the whole package. So they're not just, it's not just like this scientist has a novel idea about climate change. It's like, this is a person for whom like the, the available structures were not possible. And so they had to make a radical break with everything that they had inherited in terms of like, you know, blueprints for life. And she was really um, exemplary of that, I think. So she had lived all over the you know, country driving a covered wagon for some years. She was an itinerant preacher um, and she's trans. So she was like in the back country preaching to folks who probably wouldn't have been so friendly to her if, if they'd known who she was. Um, and then she had this amazing story where it was like part of her, part of her ministry that she would come out at some point. And the way she framed it was like, I had to teach these Christians that they were hypocrites. Like, this is how you love your enemy. Yeah, yeah. And I get chills when I think about it, you know, but everything about her was um, pretty confrontational. You know, she just, because she had forsaken all of the trappings and comforts of, you know, modern life, she was completely free in some respects to say, yeah whatever she wanted to do, whatever she wanted. And sometimes she ended up hurting people. So that's also part of the story. Um, she, she wasn't a saint, but um, so that's Benicia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she, she's, I remember reading that in the Believer and thinking, whoa, just Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> like absolutely fascinating. Uh, uh, but I, I, I don't know that, in, uh, you had an ongoing relationship after you, you, you wrote that piece, right? I mean, you, you, you were in contact with her. Yeah, I mean, we weren't uh, like talking every day or anything, but yeah. we had a few phone calls after that. And then there was some idea that maybe I would go to California. She ended up having to sell her horses and um, kind of move into town because all these years of rough riding and bending over and making camp yeah. with yeah. upper joints. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then she passed away during yeah. coronavirus from a heart attack. So. Right, right. Yeah, that's in there, right? I mean, the, the, that, you know, a little bit of that kind of uh, uh, communication. Uh, yeah. The other thing that's in there is, is a, a kind of turn toward bitterness. 
which kind of stood out to me. I thought you did a really great job, you know, without undoing her and, and, and what she achieved. Uh, uh, um, but that turn toward uh, almost becomes kind of cautionary, uh, you know, in these kind of chaotic, uh, 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 you know, kind of messianic kind of ambitions of, of uh, and wanting the world to change when in fact it doesn't change or you're not heard or, or you know, where does that actually go? If, if, if you haven't, you know, made the case or won the day, uh, yeah. one of the places, one of the dangers, uh, not necessary, but one of the dangers is that is a little bit of that tone of bitterness, you know, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, well, and there was a kind of, you know, she basically even referred to herself as Jesus, which I think was, I mean, everything with her, none of it was really entirely in earnest. It was all in earnest and also it was a tool, like language was a tool. Yeah. Um, but I do think there is, yeah, it was messianic and, the, and, and she suffered, <laughs> she suffered. Yeah. 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 I think there was tremendous loneliness for her. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine so. Yeah. Um, yeah. How about, uh, let's see, there, there are any number of people I want to get to, uh, and we're not going to get to all of them for sure. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, how about Fernando? Uh, uh, yeah. So Fernando Moreira is um, a tracker from Portugal who learned to track. Well, first he learned to track with his father, who was a military tracker. Um, and this is just all he did as a kid. He, he, it's like the morning he'd wake up, he'd track all morning until he had to walk something like six miles to the primary school. And then when he'd come home, he'd have all these chores and then he'd track again. So he was like a lifelong obsessive with uh, animal and, and, and man tracking, but he ended up going, um, he was conscripted or, or maybe he joined up. I don't, I think he joined up actually, but um, he joined the military when he was 14 or something and went to go, you know, fight on behalf of Portugal's dwindling um, grip on their colonies in Africa. So it was like, you know, very dirty <laughs> stuff that he was involved with. And he was a kid. Um, but he learned to track there like he became an expert um, in part because it was this super high stakes adrenalated situation. And then he moved to the States and his family moved there too. And he spoke no English and didn't have much education. Um, and he had to work two jobs. I mean, it was like he was working constantly, but he kept perfecting this tracking skill. And then you jump forward like, I guess 20 years and, and he's working for all these SAR teams and, um, contracting for sheriff's departments and um he's really amazing guy he's, he's a sweet guy he's he's very um you know it's sort of a it's like a laser light show to watch him um follow a trail yeah yeah but kind of the how does he fit into the book you know it's he to me was the example of like maybe all my life i've had an interest in these highfalutin philosophical concepts about the natural world and our relationship to it, but it's all kind of, it's just left brain, blah, blah, blah. And of course I've had some important embodied experiences in the natural world, but um, this was an example of a guy who had none of that. He's not an enviro, he's not a liberal. He doesn't like, he doesn't speak our language, but um, he has like the most amazing relationship to the earth because he spends all day on his hands and knees in yeah. relationship with it. And um, that was a revelation to me. Like that's that's not me inserting revelation later for the purposes of the story. Like yeah. Yeah. It, it humbled me. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. It's, you know, uh, um, he comes across just terrifically too. And again, there's, you know, one of the things in nonfiction is you gotta be able to kind of uh, do portraiture on the fly. So he's wearing a yellow scarf is that you know i mean, just love little things like that but the other thing that he introduces and, and it because it, it, it uh you know this book doesn't uh it doesn't set out an argument but there is a case being made but it doesn't have the logic of argument you know like you're being you're being kind of being beaten paragraph by paragraph into into kind of a corner uh oh you got me uh um uh but but it, very associative and one of the associative things is he he believes that everyone has a right to come home you know, which becomes 
uh, I, it's like a bell that's rung and it echoes down through the rest of the book once he's, you know, kind of, uh, he, I don't think he ever comes back. Uh, but but that right to come home uh, uh, kind of blossoms and, and, and flowers in its own way uh, beautifully. I'll, I'll say this too, you know, it's not maybe like a part of the what we're doing here, but you read that essay in an early draft. Yeah. yeah. And um, what it was like, it was like visiting the psychoanalyst in a way because um, it, you really unlock something for me with a simple question, which is like, you know, you've, you've set this stage, but the question underneath everything is, where are you? Yeah. yeah. Because it's tracking yeah. lost and missing people. Where are you? Where are you? That's the refrain. And where are you? You're yeah. not in it. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I think, yeah. And so the essay also becomes about this, experience of you know estrangement we can talk about estrangement from the natural world etc but really like there's a problem with estrangement from one another right mm -hmm. uh and you said there's a lot of people in this book and i think one of the reasons there's so many people in this book is because i'm fighting my own feeling of alienation <laughs> um but also the tradition that i came up in was sort of anti-person like the Right. The fantasy was of being like a lone wolf on the landscape and not needing people. Yeah. And just being able to need people and to say that I need people has been, um, it, it, that was sort of the hidden story of the book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like it. I mean, I, you, I mean, you do a pretty good job kind of, uh, you know, kind of sketching in all that stuff. But people are, are often the culprit, right? They're the problem. And then there's even a chapter of the problem of other people, uh, uh, right? Isn't that what it is? That's uh, called, yeah, the problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, uh, oh, what, what other, uh, <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm trying to pay attention to the time and oh, I yeah. want to talk about some of the issues. One that jumped out at me kind of, uh, fly, comes out of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, Fernando notes on the living trail, uh, section, um, and it's about relationships. I thought this was so powerful. And this also just kind of opens up and, and uh, uh, you know, kind of goes, but it's, it's this line uh, um, where, where you say, the metaphors we use to describe our world and, and the stories we tell about our place in it, they're important, but they are no more important than the crucial embodied requirements of intimate relationship, proximity, frequency, intensity, and duration. You don't have to be perfect or even especially good to have a relationship, but you have to keep showing up. Um, and, and that sense of, of, of things, of, of proximity, frequency, intensity, and duration becomes something much more than uh, uh, um, really about a, a relationship, uh, intimate relationship, um, and, and seems to kind of spread and, and, and enlarge and, and grow. And, and the people that you in, you uh, kind of write about afterwards all kind of have that in one way or another, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, but I thought it was, I love that part. Uh, Thanks. I think it's, you know, these are, of course, it's like, who am I writing to? It's who am I telling this to? I'm sure a lot of people don't need to be told, but um, I'm telling myself, you know? <laughs> well, maybe other writers understand this. Because <laughs> for me, I mean, the, I think the line preceding it is like, you can, you can read a book about relationship and learn something, but you, you can't have a relationship by reading a book, you know, <laughs> like yeah. with another person. Yeah. So, and the reason I, I feel the need to say that is because I think it's my inclination or maybe it's my response to my uh, environment or whatever uh, to try to kind of reason my way through this stuff. And I yeah. think there's a place for that, but, you know, it's like when you hear people kind of problem solving about, you know, I don't know, soil degradation or whatever. You kind of wonder like how many of these people are on their hands and knees, like with the soil and, you know, trying remediation and seeing what happens the next day and waking up and, and showing up at different times and different weather, you know, like, I, I just think this, it, the estrangement is inherited and it's pervasive and I don't think it's easy to get over, but I, but I do think it's probably important um, in order to kind of like anchor the stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it is. 
And uh, it's also, yeah, you're talking about these large things, but uh, but it all comes down to kind of things that it can be be pretty much grounded. Uh, from there, you move on to that kind of ideas of interdependence and cooperation as survival skills. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you know these are these are things are starting to kind of dovetail uh, and enlarge because they're in conversation with each other. Um, uh, you know, uh, and that's something I got from Peter. You know, this is my friend who we've been on these parallel tracks, and yes, he's really yeah. stuck with all this stuff. But at some point, he was like, you know, all that stuff we learned where they're just obsessed with your ability to make a fire yeah. in record time and all that, you know, he's like, it's just not as important. You can learn that stuff. Yeah. The, the hard stuff is interdependence and cooperation, social skills, like these social technologies, uh, conflict resolution te technologies, um, you know, ways of forming up a group and bonding because many hands make light work, you know, like people aren't really designed to sort you watch that show alone, it's like, Jesus, no wonder it's so hard because you you have to do everything, you know? But in a way, we're all in alone, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things I kept thinking uh, along the way, because, I, because I'm, because i you know, whatever, uh, uh, I was starting to feel like, oh, this is, this, this is so right, but the problems are so, it's just kind of enormous and so overwhelming. I was, you know, there was, I was starting to kind of, uh, just feel smaller and smaller <laughs> and less and less capable of, of, of kind of meeting, meeting the thing. But the, the, the chapter on restoring paradise was really interesting to me, partly because I was sinking down into this, like, well, what can one person do? Uh, you know, uh, you know, the scale of the thing is so, and can you talk about that? The, it, particularly the, uh, the weather makers, uh, uh, I thought they were amazing, you know? Uh, yeah, they're amazing. Um, well, I will say also that I think Ron Good is a is a good example of somebody who is one person. I mean, he wouldn't say he's one person. He's very quick to give the credit to everybody else. But um, here's a guy, North Fork Mono Elder, who has just done this amazing work in the Sierra Nevada, restoring these meadows that were traditional, um, traditionally managed by his people. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's this whole story with the Forest Service kind of like, you know, creating the conditions for these massive wildfires that, you know, and what, not just them, but like colonial fire suppression. But, um, you know, one of the meadows that I got to visit with him had been totally overrun with brush and, and these desiccated conifers, and there was like trash and debris, and it was like a mess. Mm -hmm. And within 15 years after he was doing this controlled burning and um, volunteers were clearing out the land, it was it was restored. I mean, it wasn't restored to its original health, but it was getting there. Like every year there were more and more species returning and they didn't plant anything. That's the amazing thing. All he did was burn and all these species returned. Yeah. Uh, mammals and plants. And so one person could do a lot, you know. Um, we can't it, the whole like, <laughs> that whole thing with the meadow then uh, uh, kind of, um, um, echoes with the larger scale thing. And very similar things happen, but just on a different scale. That's, yeah. you know. Yeah, so uh, to get back to your question, the weather makers. Now, I will say, you know, I'm a poet and a, not a very well-trained one. So I don't, I'm not a scientist or a biologist or I'm like, and I, these caveats are throughout the book, you know, because I just don't, I don't want to put anybody on. I'm not going to like right. put my tie and speak with right. authority and stuff that I don't know anything about. But Conceptually, I will say, I'm confident, this is a promising idea, which is that there are certain places that they call climate crucibles that are, at, are like a fulcrum or a fulcrum within a fulcrum where, you know, these lands have been decertified over however many generations, usually by overgrazing or agriculture, um, mm -hmm. that if you could restore them, and what does that mean? Like, restoring inlets, you know, sinking water, finding ways to sink water, and then maybe planting some native species, but like pretty minimal intervention, that if those places get restored, it can affect weather patterns, you know, um, like across regions. So the one place that they're really focused on restoring is the Sinai Peninsula, because it's their belief that if, if Lake Bardwell, which is this very uh, particular spot. If that can be restored, then it could shift weather patterns like bringing more moisture back to 
the west coast of the United States, which obviously would be hugely important for all of us as we enter fire season to have some of that moisture return. So um, it's these seem like things that are definitely worth exploring and throwing a lot of money and brains at, you know, rather than um, like trying to export the richest people on the planet to outer space to some like place that isn't even habitable. It's, you know. Although I heard one of those yeah. one of those newly new astronauts say that, well, they were just blown away and they can see what you know the future should be like, that they were going to put all the polluting uh, manufacturers out in outer space. Oh, like shoot them out of. <laughs> no, that's where like all the polluters that are, you know, I don't know, the oil yeah. refineries are going to be in outer space. And yeah. then like Amazon's just going to deliver all that shit back to Earth, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. On Friday. That's, that's yeah. preposterous, but who knows, you know? <laughs> and and by the way, that's not to dog on scientific exploration or space. No, exploration. no, no, no. That's a different thing. But I think if that's what you're hinging, your you're hitching your wagon to that is yeah. like yeah. living in a delusional world. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Um, Anyway, I really like the the scale of that. Uh, uh, um, you know, those weather makers. Uh, you know, it seemed to kind of uh, just, I don't know answer something. Uh, um, let's see. Oh, uh, let's let's talk about the work as work. Oh, good. Can Did we? you like the work? I mean, obviously, since 2014, you've been at it for like you know seven years. You're like a whole new person now. You got all you know. <laughs> you know yeah. You know, seven years. You're, you know. You know um, do you like interviewing? Do you like interviewing people? Do you like you just going around? Mm -hmm. So that's something, you know, we all have our strengths. I think sitting with people and talking to people is my favorite part of it. That's, mm -hmm. and that's something that comes naturally to me. This is the unnatural thing. Like my face is so hot right now to talk about <laughs> myself or my work for this long. Cause oh. you know, it's my <laughs> bias that I'm usually the least interesting person <laughs> in the room. So it's fun for me to draw other people out. But um, I would say the experience of writing the book was not fun. There were moments of pleasure for sure. And probably the places that you, you're reading some of my favorite parts and I think the more lyrical stuff, you know, that was, yeah. and the more sort of philosophical stuff cause I'm comfortable there. So that was more fun for me. Um, but it was a, it felt like an, an enormous burden actually that got bigger and bigger as I went. <laughs> I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. And a lot of that burden was about, um, well, one, I wanted to show as many sides of every issue as I could, you know, and, and maybe even to a tortured extent, you readers decide. But um, but writing about, I'm not writing about people who are have institutional shelters and are tenured professors or celebrities or something. I'm writing about people who are living in kind of precarious situations. Um, and it would be very easy to blow somebody's life up if you aren't really cautious about <laughs> how you proceed. Um, yeah. But also it would be really, really boring if all of the profiles were just fluff pieces. So yeah. I had, it, I really beat my head against the wall for several years, just trying to figure out how to kind of try to capture somebody in ways that are fair yeah. to them. Yeah. I think yeah. you've done a tremendous job. I never once thought you were, you know, kind of unfair to any of the the people and to any of their causes. And uh, sometimes it surprised me because I kind of assumed you didn't grow up with the, like a kind of religious background. But your 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 kind of uh, uh, um, openness to uh, you know the, the the various kind of uh, kind of religion based uh, faith based uh, communities that you uh, uh, was you know I was tremendous. It was, oh, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, what else? It's it's also. I think we've talked about this before, but this maybe this is we'll turn it over to the uh, the uh, people who have questions. But uh, part of the art of of nonfiction is 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 the art of constructing a self who does the speaking in in that nonfiction. I think maybe you just started to address it a little bit, like you know, really wrestled with like how to you know kind of handle the different. I mean, you're doing journalism, you're doing you know kind of uh, you know science, you're doing philosophy, you you know uh, you're doing something memoiristic, uh, but not not a, a particular not. Um, it's not it's it's not Mary Carr. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love it. But, but I love that about it. You know, I mean, I, I always trust a, 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 a reluctant uh, speaker over, over, you know, a, a gabbier uh, uh, one, you know. Um, uh, I feel like if it's worth saying, then it must be difficult to say. Uh, uh, and, and so that, that difficulty of the, of the self, but, um, uh, uh, the thing that interests me about the, cons the construction of, of, of the self this, who's doing the speaking was this whole thing that uh, you came to a number of times about the, this personal journey that began in kind of the woods in the, around your house or the, or, or this vacant, these vacant spaces. Uh, it was, tr it was tr tremendously moving to me. No, I think that's, thank you. Um, yeah, so that's probably a good thing to end on. Um, I don't know how, I don't know if I'm speaking to the construction of the self, but why, like, how did this even start? It started because um, I spent a lot of time alone in these kind of like feral landscapes. Mm -hmm. uh, near our house. And the reason I spent a lot of time alone was because there wasn't like a lot of adult oversight. <laughs> um, and the one friend I had, her parents forbid her to play with me because my house was like where devil music was being made. My dad was in a band. So, you know, um, so it wasn't by choice, but what wound up happening was that I developed this relationship with by the way, as I say in the book, all of these terms are flawed, the natural world. But people, it's like the fastest route to get there. So anyway, with the natural world. Um, and a sense of, you know, I'm not religious. I wasn't raised religious. So this was new to me engaging with Christianity in this way. But, um, but I did have this sense of a kind of presence or a, you know, that's how I frame it in the book, because I don't really know what else to call it. But, you know, whatever that thing was that um, it kept me alive in part and kept me, um, nurtured mm -hmm. was the thing I was trying to serve, yeah. you know, cause you, for me, I, I had to figure out what I was serving in writing this. Cause otherwise it was too, it was impossible cause it's ambitious, you know, to try to write about this stuff. And especially if you don't feel totally confident in your own abilities, which I don't, you know, so how do yeah. I humble myself to the task? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, partly, partly, you know, I mean, you've achieved the right balance because part of, part of, I mean, you never present yourself as an expert. You've, you, you, you're the, you that's kind of deployed throughout is on a, on a quest and it involves all sorts of uncertainty and doubt and, 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 and self questioning. Uh, but meanwhile, you're, of course, you're writing all this, you know, kind of, uh, information and, 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 and as, as we go along, but, never kind of claiming it, you know, it's nice. Uh, um, it feels like sometimes we're, that we're always moving through a world of conclusions. Everyone's just, they're just, they're, no one's going to speak until they've got a conclusion. And, uh, you know, I felt very much engaged in something much more open-ended, a kind of process of discovery, uh, uh, a seeking, um, you know, um, you know, so. I will say, uh, you know, I have returned to loitering a few times while working on this book to try to figure out some some of the strategies and i think um you're a master of living in uncertainties but also when you're uncertain turning to the tactile like to the real material of the world you know yeah. that's we yeah. we always have that to come home to we belong to it you know yeah yeah the material has something it wants to say yeah it yeah. does all right are we taking yeah. questions that's yeah, good. I'm here to uh, represent the audience and read some questions uh, for you. We have a few in queue right here. Um, let's see. First of all, we have a question from Jessica who asks, uh, I'm curious about what you discovered about writing through the process of writing this book. What were some unanswerable questions you ended up finding an answer to? And how much does this book resemble the one that you thought you'd write? Wow. Hey. Um, oh, she says that you've answered some of it already. Sorry, sent oh. <laughs> early. Um, it doesn't resemble the book I thought I'd write at all. Um, yeah, I actually, I'll tell you a dream, Jess, because I know you'll be okay with this. Um, I don't know about the rest of the audience. Sorry, guys. But um, when I finished the copy edit, 
I, I was in dire straits about letting control, letting go of the, you know, project, letting go of control. It's very anxiety provoking. Um, and then I just fixate in the middle of the night on all the stuff that is wrong with it. Um, but I had a dream in that period where I was running across a freeway. And when I was halfway across, I saw that I had no shoes on and that it was covered in glass. And that sounds pretty brutal. And I've actually come, I've come to a place of peace with the book, but that was kind of my experience of writing it. Like I didn't look before I leapt and I didn't, I wasn't prepared. I didn't have shoes and, and there were way more hazards along the way than I thought there would be. So, I mean, I think it's, it's been cautionary to me in some respects. Like, I don't know that I would do quite that, like, that scale of a book again, like, <laughs> you know, maybe I will, but, uh, so one thing I learned about writing though, is that, um, you have to be willing to say that you're unsure, not just be unsure, but to say it and give the problem to the reader. And that's something my spouse helped me with a lot when I was really struggling. He's like, just explain your problem. You don't have to solve it. You don't have to give the answer. Just tell, tell the reader what the problem is. And that seemed to work okay. That's great. Um, we have, let's see, an anonymous question. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, this book has the cum uh, cumulative effect of being surprisingly hopeful. Lisa, did you feel more hopeful about our global situation when you finished it? Oh, that's so nice. Um, I have a lot of hope in the sense that I, I think what I learned in the book and that probably comes across as hopeful in the end um, is this idea of gardening that I don't, I maybe had an inkling of, a, of when I started, but this notion that, um, you know, it's not untouched pristine wilderness as invaded by sick, abusive human beings. Like those are the two poles that were usually offered, but that um, in as much as you want to generalize about anyone, you know, if we view ourselves as social animals and like, you know, whatever, we're animals on the earth. Uh, one of the special skills we have is this gardening thing, right? Which is um, a way of interacting with and, you know, encouraging biodiversity, um, interacting with our ecosystems and nurturing our ecosystems, you know, um, no more or less than squirrels garden when they plant their acorns or um, birds garden when they drop seed when they're en route or, you know, pollinators, et cetera, et cetera. Like everybody gardens. This is one of the permaculture ideas that um, really changed changed my life because I think there, you kind of have to do a lot to take that away from people. Like there have to be so many structures in place to kind of weed that out of somebody that I think as these structures start to fall apart, um, it'll probably be our natural inclination to kind of move back toward that way of relating to our um, ecosystems and to one another, that kind of back and forth without keeping track or tally. Um, and it applies to human communities too. So I, I think I've strayed a little bit from the question, but that's what makes me hopeful is that there is this thing in us that wants to be, and it's innately healing. Um, we have another question. Uh, Lisa, you talked about books that radicalized you in your teens. Uh, is there a book or are there books that had a similar level of impact on you as an adult? And maybe for my sake, actually, if you want to yeah. talk about the books that radicalized you as a teen, I'd love to, I'd love to hear. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so Ishmael was a big one. And I, and I ended up hanging out with Daniel Quinn, which was a real gift, actually. He didn't, that part, that sort of the scene, the scenes where I'm with him didn't end up in the book, but um, he died shortly after uh, Peter and I left. We made a pilgrimage to Houston and that was very powerful for me. So anyway, Ishmael, as a teenager, um, I reread it when I was writing the book and I thought it held up pretty well. I mean, there are problems <laughs> for sure, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but it's the charm remains. Um, now, during the process of writing this book, I came across literature that I probably wouldn't have read otherwise, just because I tend to read like, yeah, other stuff. 
I don't read for info as much as for art, but um, there's a whole group of books about um, traditional ecological knowledge that were, were pretty transformative. So one everybody talks about is Braiding Sweetgrass, but I think it's an amazing book. Um, uh, um, Tending the Wild by M.K. Anderson, huge compendium on, on um, you know, tribal management of lands in California. And this book, Beyond the War on Invasive Species by Dow Ryan, who I write about in the book also, um, she really rocked my world and, and continues to. So I recommend that book to everybody. And in fact, I gave it to, I had some guys come over and look at my yard to see if we could help help me sink some water because I was kept flooding. And um, I gave one of the guys the book and they all read it and they're all obsessed with it. And everybody's incorporating it into their land management now. And that's actually happened with a bunch of people. So. Um, the premise of that book, she is is a permaculture expert who had worked in um, land restoration for for the government, um, rehabilitating these damaged public lands, and she was dumping all this you know toxin on these invasive species or burning them out, and just became really disillusioned with this kind of all out assault napalm kind of you know orientation toward invasive species, and. It turns out a lot of this emerging research shows that, you know, some of them can be pretty beneficial to very degraded land. And in some cases, they might even be really helpful allies in remediating um, super fun sites, former, yeah. you know, mines. And, and yeah, so that book's highly recommended. Yeah, you know, I'd say about this book, if I can just cut in, it's full of books. And all the ones you just mentioned, I was like, oh, making little notes to myself. I got to look at that. Oh, uh, good. Carl Rogers. There, you, I don't, oh yeah. There's a lot of psychology in there too. <laughs> you can just rake the end notes and then, and then be reading forever. Uh, John, is it John Liu? Uh, oh yeah. The John documentarian? Is yeah. The, but the documentarian, you know, yep. I see the documentaries now, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, we just have one more question before we wrap up tonight. Uh, Lisa, who are the writers who influence the prose of believers? Oh, that's a great question. I wish, you know, I just cleaned my office today, but I had them all stacked up everywhere. Um, so I mentioned Charlie's book, Loitering. I kind of have these nonfiction touchstones that I return to. So um, to give you the flavor of the book, I'll list a few. I was reading like, you know, Eula Biss and Janet Malcolm and... Um, Philip Gurevich's masterpiece on the Rwandan genocide, yes. that opening yes. chapter is just like blows your hair off, blows your hair back, top of your head off, either one. Uh, but then I was also reading like Megan Dom and Jonathan Lethem and these kind of like comedic Gen Xers. Um, not that the book is like funny, but I tried to inject some humor here and oh, there. You, do. you definitely do. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. You need it, right? Like you just, it's like a little cup of water on the marathon. You know, it, it, it works. It works. I didn't mention it because I, I am the knowing person that will try to explain that it's funny. Uh, so I just left it alone. But there, but there's a, a, a lot of very sly humor in there. Uh, it's good. Thank well, you. wonderful. Yeah. Um, we are at the end of our evening here, but I want to express my enormous gratitude once again to Lisa and Charles uh, for this really delightful conversation. Um, and thanks to all of you out there for spending your night with us. Um, yeah. Seriously, go buy Believers. We have tons of signed copies. Uh, go check out Loitering over on thirdplacebooks.com. It's an amazing collection. Um, or if you're local to the Seattle area, um, you can come see us at any one of our three locations and come say hi. Uh, other than that, on behalf of the bookstore, have a wonderful week and please be well, everyone. All right. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, take care. See you, Lisa. Spencer. <laughs>